I don't know about you, but uh, when I love a book, I have to show it in a way that I love it. So I never like it when people are precious with books. I always like, the more I love a book, the more pages I fold over, the more I write in it. You're having a kind of dialogue with the book. Robert Mean Hinnick's book, Diary of the Last Man, I've written in quite a lot because it's, it's had a fantastic dialogue with me. The other tests I try with a book that I like, I go out in the rain and read it. I think that's a test because if you're getting wet and you still like the book at the end of the soaking, then that's a good book. The other thing that I try to do with a book that I like is force myself to stay on the train past my stop whilst reading the book to see if I still like the book when I have to get off and get a taxi home from the wrong stop. And try it at home. Don't try it at home. Try it on the train. But this book, I've got to tell you, I would normally get off at Wumwell, but I got a foot. I missed Wumwell. I missed Barnsley. I missed Wakefield. This book, I got off at Leeds. That's how good this book is. <laughs> and what Robert's book is, it's a book about, about the world, about the planet, about a love for the planet, and it gives voice to the voiceless, but not just voiceless people, it gives voice to a lake that appears and disappears and moves like a mist out of the moss. There's a line, sap wine, nat tune. It's giving voice to the things that aren't human, but yet deserve to be listened to. There's a central sequence called Diary of the Last Man, and that sounds forbidding and foreboding, but it isn't because towards the end it says, Perhaps I am the last man. Perhaps I deserve to be. And this whole book that you miss your stop for and you stand out in the rain to, li to read and you get caught out in the rain with, it all hinges around that word perhaps, which gives us some kind of redemption, redemption I think, and some kind of hope. So please welcome Robert Minhinnick. About two hours ago, I got off the train in Waterloo and looked around for the Royal Festival Hall and couldn't find it. And then I saw something, London Eye. And I thought I'd read this from Diary of the Last Man, London Eye. I come down Regent Street and there's nobody here. No. No one here, nobody, the only soul my own. In the Travellers Club, room after room of maps and portrait, portraits, empty leather chairs. This is where the world's wanderers brought their stories. And behind glass are the explorers' diaries, blotched by Cherapunji rain, pages thick with desert dust and such deserts. Saharan, Sonoran, the thirsty far. Then I picture the caribou-skinned aristocrats knocking their pipes out on Greenland's lava. This is where the idea of Africa was first conceived, though no one here has seen what I write, who is left to read what I might write. So I sit in the traveler's armchair and sip the traveler's gin. Yesterday might be the day when all the great astonishments must cease. A very important part of my life was uh, making a film about Iraq. And in the making of that film, I visited a bunker. The Amaria bunker in Baghdad was destroyed by the, the, the United States Air Force on February the 13th, 1991. Over 400 civilians were killed. Umgada, 
who lost many members of her family in that destruction, became a guide at Amaria, living on the site. I met her there in September 1998. Her whereabouts today are unknown. This is called After the Stealth Bomber, Umgada at the Amaria Bunker. It is years later now, but time can also run backwards. Still she squats in candlelight, Umgada in the caravan, or in 125 degrees Fahrenheit, a cockroach ticking on her divan. At night, they come out of the bunker, the children, the old people, but all a fog of flesh. One body of 400 souls is exposed in, fo in a photographic flash. They pick the wedding rings and wisdom teeth from crematorium ash. Who was it dreamed the stealth bomber? Stealth steals. Think of a smart bomb. Not so smart. Where the missiles entered Amiria, daylight was star-shaped in the sarcophagus. The concrete blasted back. All the bodies foaming like phosphorus in a bunker in Iraq. The old women took off their shoes to welcome the fire that jumped into their mouths. How quickly their children found themselves unborn. Yes, stealth steals, but still Umgada guards. Umgada who goads God with her grief and the ghosts she carries. Umgada, my guide in the charnel house corridors. What is she but a woman in desert black? Yet no desert was ever so black as the sackcloth that Umgada owns. Not the Syrian deserts, Bedouin black, its cairns of cold stones. I live very close to some marvelous dune lands, and there are woods in the dunes. And there's a plant there that grows called Skullcap. Skullcap's got a marvelous, rarely used name in Welsh called Cacullog, which means, in translation, the shrouded one. But there's an even better name for it in, in American English, and that's Madweed. And this is Madweed. Yes, there it is, woken in a willow wood. My flashlight lights the scene, its beam a spar and the splinters of spars, skerricks of light that leave me marveling at moss and the mosaics of my own skin. Look, I say to myself, for who else is there? After 3,000 years, our acquaintance is made. So I turn to the first empty page in my spell book. Oh yes, I know what it is. A remedy for all that ails us. The nervous and neurasthenic, the wounded, the wistful, for those who have sought to shuffle out of shadow. It is growing in a hush of helleberines. Under water, it seems unreachable in this nave of night air. I listen, I listen to sap wine, nut tune, taste nettle pollen pale upon the wood. But no one, no one since the Neolithic has knelt here, mouth to the madweed, mind and maid, breathing the fruits of this prehistoric plain. Then the sleet falls into the north half of my soul, 
but then the south half is stillness. I look up against the narcotic sky, are dead trees, old nests. Deer in the slacks are skittering off, in the moonlight their scuts gleaming. And I look at myself from far away, I know there is no next night for this. It is only the now I can ever have, my harvest of madweed in the white midnight.